last meeting of the Planning Commission to order. Just so you know, that clock is slow. Um, in case you're hanging on the time up there. So we have a little bit of a new procedure tonight that we are implementing the use of a consent agenda. So you'll have to bear with me a little bit while I kind of work my way through the steps on this. So I need to get a motion from the commission to proceed with the consent agenda as posted. I think we do the reports on the agenda first before we get to the consent agenda. Oh, okay. See, it's two different places. I can only do one thing at a time. <laughs> um, the chair has nothing to report. Does the vice chair have anything to report? The vice chair also has nothing to report. Nick. Uh, so just some updates on some of the activity that's happening with the city council. Um, yesterday, they had a briefing on a, I'm embarrassed to say how long this proposal has been sitting in the city, but it's a proposal to update the early engagement requirements in our code. Um, obviously, the Planning Commission is familiar with those that impact things that come before you, but it also requires a bunch of other departments to do things too, and it's taken a very long time to make what initially were some simple changes. Um, so we've had that going for seven years. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but it sounds like we are finally at the finish line, so the, the council is going to have a public hearing on that. They haven't scheduled it yet and then make a decision. Basically what it does is that it clarifies those different engagement activities that happen within those 45 days and the noticing. Like, for example, right now our code doesn't require us to do early notice to neighbors, only to recognize organizations. and so. That's a big gap in our in our process. So uh, we'll be looking at some changes for that over, over the next probably four to six weeks. Um, and then the plan, the city council did adopt the new ADU proposal at their meeting. Was it la last week? Yeah, it was last week. Um, they essentially kept almost everything that the planning commission recommended um, in doing that, but they they pulled out. There was a clause that allowed on some properties, very large properties, for ADUs to go up to 1,200 square feet. They pulled that out, so that wasn't included. Um, but the rest of it um, pretty much stayed as is. Um, so that goes into effect as soon as it's published, which will probably happen in the, sometime over the next week and a half. Um, and then away we go. We have actually have already had a number of inquiries uh, for people who want to know when it's going in. Surprisingly, those are all outside of single family properties. So uh, we might have found a spot in the city where there's a big unmet demand for um, that kind of housing. So uh, that's going on. They also they adopted a couple of map amendments as well, but uh, those were private proposals. Um, in the next couple of meetings, um, like the next planning commission meeting, most of the items on the agenda, I think all but one, are legislative in nature, so zoning changes, um, including several city-initiated changes. So just wanted to um, let you know that over the next three meetings, so through the rest of April and into May, um, we have a total of something like 16 different zoning changes that will be coming before the Planning Commission. So um, it's going to be an interesting couple of meetings. <laughs> uh, um, so I think that is all the announcements that I have, unless there's any questions for me. Any questions for Nick? Okay, thank you. So the next item on the agenda is the open forum. If anybody on the commission has something they want to bring up. Andrew? Yeah, I guess I'm... <laughs> I think I, I, many people have been frustrated by this issue of street level retail. And I'm wondering if we can't, you know, we did these affordable housing incentives where we basically relax some of our other restrictions to incentivize something that's, you know, of importance to Plan Salt Lake. And I think like our walkability, 
I think we have a sort of problem where we're in a bad equilibrium. If we don't have, you know, if you don't want to be the first person on a block to put in street level retail, and so nobody's doing it because they're losing money. And I'm wondering whether there's something we can do related to sort of street level, whether there's some restriction that we're putting on development that people find really onerous that we as a city don't really need that we could sort of use to sort of incentivize street level retail. Like if you, I'm, I, we should pro probably talk to the people who build this or might build this to talk about what they would find useful, but um, whether it's, oh, it could just be staff review. So something wouldn't have to come before the commission or it's a change in the height restriction or, or, or a dropping of the height restriction. I, I don't know whether anybody else is interested in looking into this, but it's a constant source of frustration to me when we see project after project that doesn't put in street level retail in core neighborhoods that we, and I understand why they're doing this. this is not on the developers. I understand exactly why they're not putting it in. It is not profitable, but it, it is frustrating to me. Can you have staff maybe be able to address that? Yeah, may, maybe, um, Commissioner Yen, we can have a conversation about, and maybe some more detail about what, you're, what you'd like to see us research or look into, and we're happy to do that, and then bring something back to the commission. Okay. Anyone else have anything they need to bring up tonight? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to the consent agenda. So I need to have a motion to proceed with the consent agenda as posted. I'll move we, could, <clears throat> I'll move we proceed with the consent agenda as posted. I'll second that. Okay, I have a motion from Com Commissioner Shear and a second from Commissioner Christensen. Hi, Commissioner De Oliveira. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Gale. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Ghent. Uh, I abstain because I was not present for the March 29th meeting. Okay. Commissioner Lee. Uh, abstain as well. Okay, so Commissioner Tuttle. I wasn't present, but I can vote yes, can, yes. to the consent agenda. So, right? Yeah, so what, what we're doing right now is just agreeing to move forward with the consent agenda. We're not agreeing to approve the items on the consent agenda. That's the next step, so there's no need for anyone to abstain, abstain from this. Abstain, because you're here now. Um, when you get to the opportunity when you vote on items on the consent agenda, you can abstain from a voting on a particular item and vote on the rest if they stay on the consent agenda, but that will happen after, after the public hearings on those items. Yeah, this is gonna take a little getting used to. Yeah, then I'll say yes then. <laughs> You'll say yes then? Okay. Uh, Commissioner Gant, would you like to revise your? Uh... I would, yes. Right. Yes, okay. Commissioner Tuttle. Yes. Commissioner Shear. Yes. Commissioner Paredes. I'll vote, I'll vote yes. Commissioner De Oliveira. Yes. Commissioner Christensen. Yes. Commissioner Burroughs. Yes. Commissioner Berry. Yes. And the chair will also vote yes. So we're approving moving forward with the consent agenda. So do any of the commissioners want to have a discussion about any item on the consent agenda? Okay, we will open a public hearing for anyone in the public who wants to speak on an item on the consent agenda. And I have cards here from Christma Rob. Christina, okay, you put too many lumps in your N. <laughs> come, come up to the podium and state your name for the record. And I see you're with the um, community council, so you'll have five minutes. Yay, I won't take that long. So I'm Christina Robb, and I serve as the chair of the East Liberty Park Community Organization, the ELP Co. Um, we're here today for a couple of reasons. First, we um, didn't realize that this was going to be 
on the consent agenda just um, simply because we were under the impression that they'd pulled this um, away, you know, from the conditional use process. Um, we did get a lot of feedback on this particular property, um, this is 1005 East Princeton, I believe, um, regarding the owner occupancy issues. And I want to give a shout out to Cassie, who attended our meeting while I was concussed from my car accident and um, showed incredible planning leadership to help us through the process and to understand from some very upset Elbco neighbors what um, how that owner occupancy um, process would work when investors come in and buy a property, raise the property, build a larger main building as well as an ADU. So we really appreciate that planning support on that from both Nick and Cassie. Um, um, so this participant or this requestant, requestant wasn't able to meet, come to our meeting, so we weren't a actually able to answer questions from this applicant, um, which, you know, that kind of makes it a little hard for um, folks who come to the meeting to, to do that. But again, Cassie, Cassie was really good with this. Um, so we have, you know, understanding the rules and understanding that this meets the zoning requirements and that the, you know, the permit will be issued and followed through by building services and enforcement, everybody who will make sure it's the best property um, potential for both the applicants and the neighbors. Um, again, we thank you. I do want to stress, though, that we are seeing a lot of building enforcement issues in Elpco and short-term rentals. So. Um, you know, we realize this isn't your issue, but we want to thank you for hearing the public out. There was a lot of public engagement. And um, thank you for your part in the process. And was, does that apply to both of those petitions? Oh, I, I have something different to say about the other one. Do you want me to do it now? Um, yes, please. Okay, so the, the gentleman over here, the applicant for the um, 800 East ADU project, had also fallen off our radar because this came before us way back in August, September of 2022. So again, we were surprised to see it on this agenda as a conditional use, um, just kind of pop up. Um, I have talked to the gentleman. We didn't get a chance to have him to our meeting, but I did just get to ask him some great questions and to kind of understand and let him know that as a constituent, we support him as well as the neighbors in the area. And there were some issues that came up, not necessarily with the ADU, but the combined with, you know, the, the main building permitting and the ADU. And we trust, again, that our planning staff has worked through all of those issues and that, you know, it's on our radar and, you know, we support what the ordinance says and we support the planning in continuing not only that good work, but, um, but moving forward um, with the building inspectors and the civil enforcement that they will help us ensure that um, legal uses are, are um, happening in these ADUs in Elpco. Again, we probably wouldn't be stressing this important part if um, we hadn't seen so much illegal use um, pop up recently as a result of the ADU aid debate. You know, uh, obviously, politically charged things are going to enable people. So, Planning Commission, again, thank you for hearing us. Um, you know, kudos to the planning staff. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, is there anyone else who wants to speak on any item on the consent agenda? Seeing no one, are there any emails? We, we received some before. You talk. Sorry. <laughs> we received some before five, and those were all forwarded to the commission's drop box, but we haven't gotten any after that time. Okay, thank you. Okay, then I will go ahead and close the public hearing.
bring this back to the commission. Is there any discussion on the consent agenda? And then if there's not, so your options here is you could ask for something to be removed from the consent agenda, or we can have a motion to approve the entire consent agenda. And this is where, like Nick said, if you were, need to abstain that you don't want to vote on approval of the minutes because you weren't at the meeting, that's where this is where you would put that in. I uh, motion to approve the, con the consent agenda as it stands. I'll second. Okay, I have a motion from Commissioner Christensen and a second from Commissioner Shear. Any discussion? Okay, Commissioner Barry. Yes. Commissioner Burroughs. I'll vote yes on the consent agenda items, but abstain on the minutes. And can I make a comment now? Oh, sure. Um, in response to the ELPCO's um, comments, the, the ADUs are still a conditional use if they're uh, detached, um, if they're a detached unit, like a different building. Um, but maybe that's changing based on Salt Lake City Council's it is. Uh, vote. So those won't be conditional anymore. Um, but they're always subject to enforcement. So they did maintain the rule, though, that the ADUs in a residential area must be owner-occupied, right? Yeah, Director Norris? If, it's, if an ADU in a single-family dwelling is required to be owner-occupied, no. If it's outside of a single-family dwelling, it's attached to something else that's not required to. If it's in the yard of a single family dwelling, it also is if it's, required to. If, if it's on the, pro if an ADU is on any s property that contains a single family dwelling, so whether internal or external, it's. So those, was, those are, thank you. Those are still subject to enforcement. So go ahead and use the enforcement tools that you have. Thank you. Commissioner Christensen? Yes. Commissioner De Oliveira? Yes. Commissioner Paredes? I'll vote yes. Commissioner Shear? Yes. Commissioner Tuttle? Yes. Commissioner Lee? Yes, but I abstained from the minutes. I wasn't here. Okay. Commissioner Gant? Yes, but I abstained from the minutes because I wasn't here. Commissioner Gale? Yes. Chair will also vote yes. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's eleven yeses. The consent agenda has been approved. Now we'll move on to items on the regular agenda. I'm going to ask that we um, that I get a motion to change the order of the items on the agenda and have the second item first because of the volume of public hearing on the second one madam chair yes uh, I would like to move that we rearrange the uh, agenda of the two remaining public items so that number two becomes number one and number one becomes number two thank you commissioner Shear. do I have a second second I have a second from Commissioner Gale. Gant, I'm sorry. They put him right next to you on the list. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Barry. Yes. Commissioner Burroughs. Yes. Commissioner Christensen. Yes. Commissioner De Oliveira. Yes. Commissioner Paredes. Alvo, yes. Commissioner Shear. Yes. Commissioner Tuttle. Yes. Commissioner Lee. Yes. Commissioner Ghent. Yes. Commissioner Gale. Um, I'm going to abstain on this. As I have to recuse myself from one of these matters, I'd prefer, out of abundance of caution, not to vote on anything related to it. OK. And the chair will vote yes. So we have 10 yeses. and. One abstention. So let's move forward with the modifications to a plan development and design review for the Harvey 
a mixed use structure at approximately 501 and 511 and 515 East, 2700 South. Case number is PLNPCM 2021-01092 and PLNPCM 2021-01254. Sarah, there you are, thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. So these, this is mod a modifications request for the Harvey. So this project originally re received approval on February 9th of last year. It received plan development approval for additional building height, as well as an increase in the lot size maximum and for encroachments in the rear and buffer yards. And it also received design review approval for modifications to the front and corner side yard setbacks for sunken garden level patios and for encroachment of canopies into the front and corner side yards. It later came back to the commission in May for removal of the sunken garden level patios on 500 East and then removal of three staircases and some changes to the building materials. The modifications before you tonight involve the removal of the parking garage with automated stalls and replacement of that with a 15 stall surface parking lot. And above that, there um, were two residential units, a gym and a roof deck that will also be removed. There are very minor changes to street facing facades. And there's also a new request for reduction in the landscape buffer and waiver of the interior parking lot landscape Chair, requirement. Can I just quickly interrupt? We've had some technical difficulties with our recording. So we need to pause for just a few minutes while we get that fixed. Um, so. Okay, Sarah, hold okay. off. Okay. We're going to take a moment here. <laughs> um, Sarah, backtrack a little bit and start Great. wherever you feel like you need to. Sure. So the modification request before you this evening is for the removal of the parking garage with automated stalls and replacement of it with a 15 stall surface parking lot. And then above that parking garage, the removal of two second floor residential units, a gym and a roof deck. And then there are some very minor changes to the street facing facades. And there's an additional request for reduction in the landscape buffer along the north side of the property. And then the waiver of the interior parking lot landscaping requirement. And so you can see here the approved elevation on the left and then the request removes that parking garage and replaces it with a surface parking lot. Um, and then zooming in along that north property line, um, you can see where they have the new request for the reduction in the landscape buffer. And then below that is where the parking lot would be lo is located. And again, the very minor changes to the front, which are generally regarding windows on the 500 east elevation and somewhat similar um, changes on the 27th south elevation. And then looking at the north elevation, you can see the removal of the garage. And so you would then see the surface parking lot and then the rear of the units that are facing 27th south. And then on the east elevation, you can see the removal of the garage and the two residential units. And then in that location, you would see the rear of the units that are facing 5th East. And the same standards of review apply. The property is located in the CN zoning district. There are design standards for that zoning district in 21A37. And then it's a plan development and design review projects. So those standards apply. So a staff is recommending approval of the proposed modifications. And that concludes staff's presentation. The applicant is here to answer questions, but does not have a presentation. Okay, does the commission have any questions for the applicant at this moment? Or let's, let's do the public hearing first, and then we'll bring him up and... So I'm going to open the public hearing on this item. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak on this item? None of these are, none of these are for this item, are they? No. Okay. Seeing no one, I will close the public hearing on this item and bring it back to staff and the applicant. Do we have any questions for either staff or the applicant? I have a question. Does this change the number of parking spaces? Yes, it reduces the number of parking spaces from 29 to 15. And is that still um, within, does it still comply with? Yes, parking? it complies with the requirements for the zone. Thank you. 
Anyone else? Questions? Okay, or a motion? I'd like to make a motion. Based on the information presented and discussion, I move that the commission approve this application based on the staff's recommendation. Okay, I have a motion from Commissioner Christensen. Can I get a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Commissioner Tuttle. Commissioner Berry? No. Commissioner Burroughs? No. Commissioner Christensen? Yes. Commissioner De Oliveira? No. Commissioner Paredes? I will vote no. Commissioner Shear? Yes. Commissioner Tuttle? Yes. Commissioner Lee? Yes. Commissioner Ghent? Yes. Commissioner Gale? No. And the chair will vote yes. One, two, three, four, five, six yeses. One, two, three, four, five noes. So it passes by one vote. Good luck. Okay, now we'll move on to the second I item. <laughs> the first move to the second item on the agenda is the conditional use for the come and go gas station at approximately 2011, 2111 South 1300 East, case number PLN PCM 2022 0053. Chair, we may need to pause again. The audio's out again. Oh, okay. Stand down. <clears throat> We're taking a pause for a moment. A pause. So our next item on the agenda is the condi conditional use for the come and go gas station at approximately 2111 South 1300 East, case number PLN PCM 2022-00053. Diana. Chairperson Bachman. Yes. I need to recuse myself from this matter as there's a obvious conflict of interest. The firm representing the applicant is also the law firm for which I work as an attorney. Thank you for letting us know. We'll see you later. Thank you. Um, just Madam Chair, does Commissioner, um, I can't remember. Gail. Gail. I can only think of your first name. Since this is the last thing on our item or on our agenda, she might just be able to go home. I, I think that would be appropriate. We'll give her a chance to figure out how to get out of here. <laughs> More important. Yeah. Okay. Diana, I think you're good to go. Okay. The subject property's location is at the southeast corner of the 2100 South and 1300 East intersection. This is shown on the map. I think we're all very aware of where this is. The subject property is located adjacent to Sugar House Park to the west side of the park. The property is privately owned and, it, and is not part of Sugar House Park or owned by Salt Lake City. The project request is a conditional use application for a gas station in the CB or Community Business Zoned District. The applicant is proposing a 3,957 square foot convenience store building, which would be located on the northeast corner of the property, excuse me, the northwest corner of the property, and three two-sided gas pumps, which would be positioned at the south end of the property. I'm trying to point that out. I'm not sure if you can see that. The proposed underground fuel storage tanks would be along the east property line. Those are these to the right. I'm hoping you can see the cursor. 
the recommendation based on the findings listed in the staff report it is st planning staff's opinion overall that the project does not meet the applicable standards or the intent of the sugar house master plan nor can it successfully mitigate adverse impacts to the adjoining property or water source sugar house park and parley's creek therefore the planning staff recommends the planning commission deny this conditional use application request Starting off with the conditional use purpose statement. A conditional use is a land use which by, because of its unique characteristics and potential impact on the municipality, surrounding neighbors or adjacent land uses may not be compatible or may be compatible only if certain conditions are required that mitigate or eliminate the negative impacts. Conditional uses are allowed unless appropriate conditions cannot be applied, which in the judgment of the Planning Commission or Administrative Hearing Officer would mitigate adverse impacts that may arise by introducing a conditional use on the particular site. Just to start, this is the standard for a conditional use. A conditional use shall be approved if reasonable conditions are proposed or can be imposed to mitigate the reasonable anticipated detrimental effects of the proposed use in accordance with applicable standards set forth in Ordinance 21A 54080. If the reasonably anticipated detrimental effects of a proposed conditional use cannot be substantially mitigated by the proposal or the imposition of reasonable conditions to achieve compliance with applicable standards, the conditional use shall be denied. Sorry, follow along. Staff used the conditional use standards and determinations list in Ordinance 21A54 to analyze the application. There are four approved standards. The proposed request does not meet three of these standards. These are noted in the staff report on page 68. In addition, there are 15 detrimental effects determinations. These are noted on page 69 of the staff report. Four of these determinations are identified as detrimental impacts from the proposal that cannot be mitigated. That is shown in red. You don't need to see the, the, the rest of the text, but just showing you. Six of the de determinations have been de deemed to show that significant detrimental impacts may be lessened by imposing conditions but cannot fully or adequately mitigate all potential contaminating effects. The State of Utah Property Rights Ombudsman answers the question, what are detrimental impacts? By stating, the detrimental impacts identified for a conditional use should be related to negative impacts on legitimate government interests or on the public welfare. Salt Lake City Municipality and Salt Lake County governments co-own Sugar House Park which is the second largest government collaboratively owned and maintained public park in the Salt Lake Valley. It is a hugely popular park with the residents of Salt Lake City and to others county and statewide. The planning staff has recommended a list of conditions if the planning commission chooses to approve this conditional use request. These recommendations can be found on page 20 of the staff report. Again, these conditions will, may only lessen some significant detrimental impacts, but cannot fully or adequately mitigate all potential contaminating effects on the groundwater systems, creek, or so soils in or downstream of the park. The planning staff considered the groundwater source protection overlay district to analyze this proposal. The subject property and Sugar House Park are both located in a secondary recharge area protected by the groundwater source protection overlay district, which serves to protect, preserve, and maintain existing and potential public drinking groundwater sources in order to safeguard the public health, safety, and welfare of customers and other users of the city's public drinking water supply, distribution, and delivery system. The secondary recharge area provides the 
primary means of replenishing groundwater as a secondary drinking water source, which can be up to 10% of the city's water supply. Under the Groundwater Source Protection Overlay District, ground, underground petroleum storage tanks are listed as restricted uses in the secondary recharge area and therefore present a potential contamination source. We are all aware of the warnings associated with, gas with gasoline chemicals. Exposure can occur through inhalation of toxic vapors and exposure to contaminated soil and water sources. The planning staff studied three of, its propo of this proposal's most significant potential detrimental impacts. The three identified as potentially causing the most harmful environmental impacts to the adjacent properties and those downstream are underground fuel storage tanks, or USTs, contaminated surface runoff of gas, oil, and other chemical exposure, and vehicular traffic to and from the site, including fuel delivery trucks. This chart shows those three sources with possible detrimental impacts and the consequences. The first source would be the underground fuel storage tanks, USTs. The possible detriment impact would be a fuel leak underground. The consequence would be contamination, contamination to Sugar House Park, soil and or Parley's, excuse me, Parley's Creek water. The second source would be contaminated surface runoff. This is of gas, oil, or other chemicals from the subject site. The possible detrimental impact would be that it enters the storm drain system. The consequence would be contamination to Parley's Creek, which is, a which is located in the secondary recharge area, which supplies groundwater, which, which replenishes groundwater supply, and the downstream water sources. The third is the vehicular traffic trips per day to and from the subject site by patrons and fuel delivery trucks. The possible detrimental impact would be increased vehicular traffic and added fuel delivery trucks to immediate collector streets. The consequence would be disturbances to residential properties and the community along 2100 South and Parley's Way, including the park. An underground fuel storage leak or contaminated surface water runoff would cause considerable harmful and damaging effects on the soil, water, and air quality in and around Sugar House Park. Information in the staff report from the De Department of Environmental Quality on page 10 shows that one in four inspected USTs, again, underground storage tanks, in 2022 had fuel leaks. Research shows that one gallon can render one million gallons of water undrinkable. The average fuel leak is 524 gallons. The subject property sits at an elevation above Sugar House Park, where the two properties abut. Therefore, any leak from the proposed underground fuel storage tanks proposed to be located at the east property line or any contaminated surface runoff of fuel or other chemicals would most likely contaminate soil in, so in Sugar House Park since it is downhill from the subject property. Research shows that the degree to which leaking tanks impact soil, groundwater, and air quality depends on groundwater velocity and flow direction, soil permeability, absorption of chemicals to solids, dispersion, water table depth, chemical contents of leak, size of the leak, and many other factors. In addition, harmful chemicals found in petroleum products can pass, can pass undetected in air and water supplies. These are pictures shown. The top one is from the subject property looking into the park. The bottom one is from the park looking up at the site from the southeast. And the one on the right is from the direct south at the Seagull Lily. Sugar House Pond, which is filled from Parley's Creek, is located downhill and less than 330 feet from the subject property. Parley's Creek comes in from the east, running down from Parley's Canyon, and flows openly through the middle of Sugar House Park, filling Sugar House Pond. 
From there, the creek is piped to the west under 1300 east and reopens as a natural stream through Hidden Hollow Natural Area. Therefore, all mentioned water resources sit below the proposed gas station site, causing concern for potential contamination runoff from the proposed gas station site. This photo shows the pathway of the storm drain system and how any unfiltered contaminants from surface runoff would enter that system and then travel downstream from Hidden Hollow Natural Area and possibly beyond. I'm hoping you can see the yellow. This is kind of the, the storm drain system kind of winds around the Seagull Lily, goes underground, comes through Hidden Hollow, and then goes out towards 11th East. <laughs> The third significant detrimental impact on the community would be from vehicular traffic to and from the subject site and the fuel truck delivery truck driving route as shown in this exhibit on the right side of the page. The fuel delivery trucks would follow a route designed dedicated, excuse me, would follow a route design dedicated by Come and Go Company, which shows the fuel trucks would enter the subject property at the 1300 East ing Ingress the trucks would then unload fuel on site and then exit the subject property on 2100 South, leaving to the east. This aerial at the bottom left shows 2100 South marked in two dotted lines. The brown dotted line shows a 25 mile per hour speed restriction on a collector street section. And the green indicates a 20 mile per hour speed restriction on a collector street section. The blue lines, which may be a little bit hard to see, the blue lines are over areas with commercial or mixed residential uses, and the non-marked areas are primarily single-family dwellings. Using 2100 South to the east by fueling trucks will cause a considerable disturbance to the residents, properties, and communities, community along 2100 South, since this is not a typical route for large commercial vehicles. The Sugar House Master Plan calls for the subject property to be low intensity. It also states that there's a renewed recognition of the value of having neighborhood businesses that residents can walk to instead of having to drive to. In addition, neighborhood businesses are frequently, local, frequently locally owned, so more of the profits stay in the area. The businesses range from grocery stores to restaurants. Plan Salt Lake expresses the need for walk, cycling and walking. The automobile dependency increases air pollution, traffic, and encourages development that is designed for cars, not people. The subject proposal is a vehicular-focused development that would generate more traffic than a high-volume sit-down restaurant and is not consistent with the policies of the Sugar House Master Plan or Plan Salt Lake. The proposal's motivation is for the sale of gasoline to vehicular traffic. The overall impacts that would negative, negatively impact the immediate vicinity are environmental impacts to the air, soil, and water quality, and quality of life reduction by way of increased traffic. Again, based on the findings listed in the staff report, the planning staff recommends that the Planning Commission deny this conditional use application request. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Um, I think we'll wait and hear from the applicant. So is the applicant here? You want to come up, sit at the table, state your name for the record, and you'll have 10 minutes to give a presentation. Then we'll go to the public hearing, and there'll be more time for discussion here. later. Do you want to do my second hearing? And get close to the microphone because it's they're they're not very sensitive. <laughs> okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> um, Chairperson Bachman, Planning Commission, thank you for your time and attention tonight. My name is Chris Hogel. I'm a lawyer for uh, the applicant tonight. And um, first, 
Um, let me start with a request that I'd like to renew. Um, if the commission is inclined to deny the application on the basis of the voluminous and technical material that the applicant received for the first time two weeks ago, we would ask that you continue this hearing so that we may have an opportunity to respond um, and give you information to make a truly informed decision. A lot of this information is information um, that we received for the first time. This slide is a, is a timeline. Um, so we, this, this whole process started uh, in January of last year and it seemed to be a collaborative back and forth process. Um, our, our application was final in November and um, we never received the technical uh, hydrogeologist report that the city had since April of last year. We never received that. We received that for the first time two weeks ago. Um, you heard the staff representative today talk about all the factors that need to be considered. Uh, water flow, uh, aspects of geology, hydro hydrology. She went on and on. We haven't had a chance to weigh in on that. We expected to get a staff report that suggested conditions, but didn't recommend denial, and it came at us like a bolt out of the blue. So it's only fair that we have an opportunity to fully inform you folks so you can make the proper appropriate decision. Um, here's an example of why that's necessary, okay? This is a figure from the hydrogeologist report that the city had since April of last year, for a year, uh, figure 12. And it's about a mile and a quarter wrong. It's a mile and a quarter wrong. It shows the site being closer to the primary um, recharge area than it actually is. We've got here a correction. This is what we've done. We've corrected the site location. It's closer to the discharge area. And as you can see from the, the sketch on the, on the right, this is from the Utah DEQ interactive map. It's the same map that the staff report cites and relies on. And what we've added here is an estimated uh, secondary recharge zone, primary recharge zone, and the discharge zone. All these blue dots represent petroleum underground storage tank sites, all of them. And you can see that as you get closer to the discharge area, like where our site is, as shown in purple, they're more clustered. They're prevalent in this area. We need more time to adequately respond. Now, if the, um, uh, turning to the um, conditional use approval standards, um, this slide lists the standards that present no obstacle to approval, right? There's 12 standards that the application satisfies. It satisfies, there's no detrimental impact, or the impact can be mitigated, and that's based on the staff report. Staff report itself indicates that these 12 standards don't stand in the way. So what does? The remaining issues are the issues associated with the underground storage tanks. The impact is to groundwater. Um, the staff report identifies fuel vapor, but uh, the staff representative didn't mention fuel vapor as a significant impact tonight. Um, but she did uh, mention runoff, surface spills, and traffic. Um, the staff position basically is there's no way that there should be a gas station at this location. There's no way. The city has already determined that there can be a gas station at this this very location. This location is zone CB. And the city has determined that a gas station is conditionally allowed in the CB zone. And the gas station is defined in the code, and this is um, section 21A62040, as a principal building site and structures for the sale and dispensing of motor fuels or other petroleum products. That's what a gas station conditionally allowed is. Now they're saying, well, you can have the convenience retail part of this, but you can't have the, the petroleum product sale part of this. The city has already determined that that can be located at this, at this pre uh, precise site. <clears throat> Utah law, <clears throat> I'm quoting from <clears throat> the Utah Municipal Land Use and Development Management Act right now, Utah code, which trumps 
city code. Quote, if a land use regulation does not plainly restrict a land use application, the land use authority shall interpret and imply and apply the land use regulation to favor the land use application. So if your code doesn't plainly restrict this use, then you have to apply city code to favor it. And does the city code uh, allow this? Yes, it allows it in the table of, of uses for the CB zone, 21A 33030. The staff report and the staff position is, no, you can't ever have a gas station at this location. That is ac asking you to nullify city code. You can't do that. Um, here's some more state law. And this is similar to, uh, the first bullet point here is similar to what's in the city code. I want to focus on what's in the second bullet point here. This is straight from M. Ludma again, city of uh, Utah law. Quote, the requirement described in subsection 2A1 to reasonably mitigate anticipated detrimental effects of the proposed conditional use does not require elimination of the detrimental effects, right? You have to approve this conditional use application if reasonable conditions are proposed to mitigate reasonably anticipated detrimental effects. Mitigation doesn't mean eliminate. They can't ask you to deny this application because we can't guarantee a perfect site. Utah law, this section here in the, in the bottom bullet says you cannot do that. You cannot require the applicant to eliminate detrimental effects. Mitigate means lessen. That's the standard dictionary definition. Lessen the severity or the harm. Does, um, does the applicant propose conditions that would lessen the severity of the harm? Absolutely. Here's a, a, a slide that talks about the, the surface water treatment plan. Okay, especially compared to the existing use, which is the Sizzler restaurant, right? That's on the, on the left, on the right, is the proposal. And I won't go through all of this. Um, this is in the, um, the response to the staff report that we submitted yesterday. Hopefully you have that. Um, I'm just gonna focus on this FlexStorm inlet filters, all right? The FlexStorm inlet filters will be 97% effective at removing hydrocarbons, 97% effective. That's before all the robust protections before and after the process, 97%. Any judge in this state is going to find that 97% is a substantial mitigation. Here's a slide that goes into further detail about the surface runoff. Uh, subgrade impacts. Um, th most of the USTs, 25%, are compliant. The ones that aren't, most of it is due to unknown causes. We can disregard that. Unknown causes do not have the support of substantial evidence. You can't deny this based on unknown causes. Seven of the leaks in the staff report identified are from corrosion. Fiberglass tanks don't corrode. The rest, only two of the leaks identified in the staff report were from subgrade tank damage or pipes problems. But we don't know anything about, you know, the age of those tanks. All we know is that this is the state of the art, and this is what the applicant will, will, will apply. This is the uh, mitigation for vapor. I'm going to skip that because that's not really an issue. Um, let me talk about traffic. Um, we, have a, we have a traffic study. There's no traffic study that challenges our traffic study. Our traffic study says that the proposed use will actually reduce traffic from what it currently is with the restaurant. It will be reduced. Why, how can that be? Because what's there right now is the Sizzler. That could be restarted. And that's a destination. People will drive there. People don't drive to a gas station. They, they go somewhere and they, they get, go to it and fill up with gas on the way. So it's not going to add any more trips. Um, and a convenience store is expressly permitted in the code. There's not going to be any more traffic than what would be expressly permitted, the convenience store use. 
um, in the battle of experts, the city forfeited because it doesn't have an expert. Our expert uh, engineering study is unrefuted. Thankfully, that's the end of my presentation. That's, that's your 10 minutes. So you guys can hang out here while the public hearing is going on. And then after the hearing, we can have more discussion. So I will open the public hearing on this at this time. I have cards if you want to speak. Fill out a card and get it to us up here. That's the most efficient way to do that. Uh, the first card I have is for uh, Judy Short, and the member, and because she's a representative of the uh, community council, she'll have five minutes. The rest of the individual members for the public will have two minutes each. Thank Take you. it away, Judy, and remember to state your name for the record. <laughs> My name is Judy Short. You I, need to get closer to the mic. We're not hearing you tonight. Is that better? How about that? There you go. My name is Judy Short. I'm the vice chair of the Sugar House Community Council and the chair of the Land Use Committee. First, I'd like to commend Diana Hernandez on a very well-written and thorough staff report. She read all the comments that were sent to her researched a lot of information to create the factual conclusions reached in her, support, her report. The reasons of the hundreds of comments received, maybe 10 were in favor of this project. The reasons listed below are a large part of the many reasons why the community does not feel this is a compatible product, project. Review of a conditional use requires review of its location, design, confirmation and impact to determine the desirability of allowing it on a site. This applicant's proposal to mitigate impacts are also taken into consideration. This use is not appropriate for this location. There's the possibility of harmful and damaging effects of gas or oil leaks because it could damage uh, the water and the air in Sugar House Park, Parley's Creek, and the community. This park has existed since the early 1950s and is a wonderful amenity for Salt Lake City, County, and the surrounding areas. Evidence of the love the citizens have for this park is evidenced by the number of comments received. Diana put about two comments on a page and the, the report was something like 550 pages long. That's even more than the Walmart project. Um, under the groundwater water source protection overlay district, underground storage tanks are restricted uses. Having a gas station within this overlay district jeopardizes the purpose of the overlay district to protect the recharge area. Underground storage tanks leak regularly in Utah. This can't be mitigated. Surface runoff can't be mitigated. Think about all the snow we had in the last month. Traffic concerns can't be mitigated. The roads are already over capacity. The level of service is E. I think it's really an F. We can't widen the roads in this area. This is a safety hazard for people who try to ride their bike or walk to the park. Fuel trucks of this large size cannot safely drive up 21st South. That's not a truck route. The Park Authority has weighed in, giving you many reasons why this proposal is not compatible. People exercise in that park all day long, every day. Numerous reasons why the proposal would be detrimental to the air the people breathe, making it no longer a wonderful place to exercise. That alone should be enough to deny the request. They quote 200 people passing by in a one minute segment of time. There are not other places to recreate at that scale anywhere nearby. The master plan calls for uses on this property to be low intensity mixed use. This is nowhere near compatible with that. We ask that you deny the request. Thank you. The next card I have is for Jacqueline Rosen, who as a member of a publicly recognized organization, you can have five minutes also. 
introduce yourself and who you're from. <laughs> Great. My name is Jackie Rosen and I'm representing the Sugar House Park Authority. Um, most of our comments were already covered by the staff report, so I will defer to many of them. But I wanted to sort of highlight some of the things that we put in our letter as well as in the attached report from the hydrogeologist that we worked with. Um, starting with actually at the end of our letter, the air quality because that has not been discussed so far. Um, as noted in the report from our hydrogeologist, um, essentially vapors from gasoline sink. They are heavier than air um, and as was shown before in the staff report, we have the Sago Lily installation which is directly downhill from where this proposed um, development is. In our hydrogeologist report, um, she stated, quote, the tendency for gasoline vapors to accumulate in low-lying areas could present a very real threat to human health in the Sago Lily installation at the western edge of Sugar House Park that serves as flood control structure and also as an entrance to the underground tunnel that connects the park with Hidden Hollow across 1300 East. Um, so that is one of the main concerns we wanted to raise because it hasn't been discussed so far. In addition, in that report, they talked about stormwater runoff, especially in that same installation. Um, the current proposal has the sort of convenience stores right on the road, and then the underground storage tanks and the areas where people will be filling up their cars are located directly next to that installation. So there is no barrier. The, any runoff would go right through that installation that we installed. Um, and the air quality would also sink into that little bowl as into the draw from the Hidden Hollow Park that goes underneath the road into the Sugar House Park. Um, I would also like to highlight our de the detrimental effects that we pointed out in our letter. Um, as noted in Salt Lake City Ordinance, the ordinance lists 15 different factors and it lists them with an and. So it doesn't matter if even one of these factors is sufficient. That is a good enough reason to deny this application. Um, we point to a few other um, things that were also raised by the Sugar House Community Council. Um, but I would just, if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Stop that. Go there. Uh, the next card I have is from Lynn Schwartz. Not too many. I'm Lynn Schwartz. The conditional use should be denied. This is an inappropriate use for the site because its detrimental effects cannot be mitigated. Salt Lake City has a stated policy that it should become a, car, a less car-centric city. Therefore, car-centric conditional uses should be denied. Monitoring for leaks does not prevent leaks. Monitoring systems only notify you if a leak has occurred. It does not mitigate a leak. We live in an earthquake zone, and we have them not infrequently. Three popped rivets or an even slightly popped seam in a storage tank and you have a leak into an extremely sensitive aqua system. Leak mitigation is very expensive, disruptive, and sometimes unsuccessful. Go to any gas station and see cars leaking all kinds of fluids all the time. There is no containment system that can handle one of our torrential downpours. Just ask the Sprague Library. This will be located at an intersection that is consistently rated as a fail by Salt Lake City. Considering the increase in traffic that will come when all the new apartments come online, this will only get worse. The addition of even more cars coming and going with this use will make an already worsening situation even worse. While delivery times may try to be limited by the owner, we all know circumstances due to weather, especially in the winter, often make schedules go wrong. Again, this use should be denied. It is not the highest best use for this property, and the detrimental effects cannot be mitigated. Thank you.
I have a card from Cynthia Spiegel. Did you want me to read your comment? Okay. I feel the risks of air and below ground water pollution cannot be mitigated. Fuel drops, tanks leak, inadvertent overfills are a matter of when, not if. Thank you. Richard Lehman. Be sure to state your name for the record and you'll have two minutes. I'm Richard Lehman. Um, I'm almost also on the Sugar House Park Board, but I'm not representing the board. I don't know if that means I can still get five minutes. Um, speaking as an individual, I submitted two testimonies on this issue. The first was about planning land use context in that the east side of 1300 east is really the border for the lower density residential areas north and east not the high density town center district on the west side second um that the site's supposed to be neighborhood serving and i submitted a great deal of comments about the competitive businesses in a roughly two and a half mile radius and how likely come and go would have negative impact. Um, but also the groundwater issue is significant, but we haven't mentioned how Parley's Creek is a tributary to the Jordan River, which in turn is a tributary to the Great Salt Lake. And that's a, an issue these days of international and national um, importance it's written about in british newspapers and the new york times um and the fact is is the safety of the water affects the park all the parks along parley's creek um and ultimately the great salt lake with regard to the comments the learned gentleman made representing come and go i i do want to say times change um the fact that there are lots of legacy USTs shouldn't be a justification to support more given climate change. Um, and, you know, given the number of comments, over 1,100 comments submitted to the Sugar House Community Council, over 500 to the city, it's not wanted. If I were a business, I would want to locate where people wanted me to locate. In that location, abutting the park is not that location um they have a extremely thank, experienced thank real estate you. staff that ought to recognize the um opportunities elsewhere thank you uh thea brannon be sure to state your name for the record and you'll have two minutes um my name's thea brannon um First, I want to thank you all for serving on the Planning Commission. It is a very tough job, and I wouldn't want it. Uh, I've been lucky to live in Sugar House for 25 years, and I want to speak in opposition to this proposal, along with almost the entire population, as far as I can tell, of Sugar House community. Um, I'm not going to focus on Would, would you get a little closer to the microphone, just so we can hear you? Um, 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 I'm going to focus. Go. <laughs> I'm going to focus on the compatibility of a gas station. Uh, that's approval standard A2. Uh, it, there's no way to mitigate that. A gas station is not compatible with the surrounding uses. That is recreation in the park, which surrounds it and is contiguous with the site on two sides. There can be no uh, barrier, buffer, or separation from all the people, the skaters, the bicyclists, the walkers, the birds, the bird lovers who use this park every day. Um, and then with regard to det detrimental effects, determination B3, the proposed use is not well suited to the character of the site. The businesses in the surrounding area do not adjoin and loom over one of our city's most iconic parks, which was preserved by the foresight of city and county leaders some 66 years ago. Do you want to despoil their vision by approving this brand's tacky signage and glaringly industrial style, which would jar with the natural environment it immediately overlooks? 
It seems to me the siting of the gas pumps directly overlooking the park is particularly egregious. And the only other thing I really want to focus on is the um, traffic. That's B5 and 8. Access to this gas station will unreasonably impact service level. And I believe that their traffic study was completely inadequate. Please don't gamble with our health and happiness. Thank you. Next up is Carol Hansen. And state your name for the record, and you'll have two minutes. <clears throat> my name is Carol Hansen. Uh, I'm representing myself and all of my neighbors and everybody I know who lives in Sugar House area. And uh, my great grandfather donated a do the land for the Sprague Branch for a dollar. And that's the kind of spirit I think we've always known in Sugar House. And uh, there's been more and more and more out of state development by large corporations with support from large uh, attorneys and law um, practices. And honestly, I think the citizens of Salt Lake are sick of it. We all strongly support what the, um, the planning uh, committee is proposing, and that's not to allow the, the, uh, the, gas, the gas station at the old Sizzler site. Nobody wants another gas station. Um, we're, we're, Sugar House is hanging by a thread onto its charm. The, the view from the Sizzler towards the mountains is one of the very few unobstructed views from the city still left, as all the high rises continue to be built all around the valley. It's, and as we become increasingly densely populated, that view from the park is very precious and must be preserved. Um, the profits, uh, the, of course the environmental uh, <clears throat> issues are uh, paramount. As, as stated earlier, one in four um, um, ISTs, ITUs, <laughs> under, underground tanks leaks. Uh, and and, water, and is, water and water is, nor, is more and more precious. Um, uh, the city has done a great job with Sugar House trying to make it more unique and the addition of the come and go adds nothing to the quality of our lives. It only lines the pockets of an out of, out of state company with, uh, which already owns 450 gas stations. Thank you. Next up is Yvonne Martinez. Hello, my name's Yvonne Martinez. Get, get close to the mic so we can hear you. How's that, is that better? That's better. Okay. Um, so I was in the meeting when Come and Go came to present to the, um, to the community and they were asked by the Chamber of Commerce after talking to their members what value they would add to the neighborhood. The response was to be a concession stand for the park. So, I checked to see if there might be park concession stands with gas pumps. I couldn't find any because nobody wants gas pumps in their park. And just the other day, as I was driving down that hill where that park's gonna be, I looked up there and thought, that's where those gas pumps are gonna be. When you come to this park, you're gonna see the gas pumps. As you go, as you're at the, the pond, you're gonna see the gas pumps. So, um, I don't think that anybody that uses the park, that lives around the park, I live just on the other side of 21st South, um, about four doors down on the other side of the street. So I'm gonna hear the tanker trucks when they come at off hours. I'm gonna hear, um, uh, you know, I could, when the fire engines come to mitigate any leaks or, or issues. Um, um, I also Googled um, gas leaks at come and goes, and I found several um, things like the tanker trucks put start to fill up the tanks, walk away, go in the store to get their snacks or whatever, and it overflows. Um, tanker trucks running into the gas pumps causing spills. 
other cars running into the, um, the pumps causing spills. So no fiberglass tanks gonna keep that from happening. And since it's right there by the Sago Lily, that whole area could easily be um, contaminated. Um, there's the air quality of the cars and trucks um, and the fumes there. There's um, the, the noise. There's the ability for, for people to go into the park after hours. Um, so I would like to ask that um, you not approve this conditional use permit because I'm practically next door. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Kim Pat Paturzo. State your name for the record and you'll have two minutes. Kim. I'm Kim Paturzo and I'm here on behalf of my neighbors and friends who are actually watching. Um, okay, I've never done this before but I'm very passionate about this. Hence my jeans, I would have uh, known how to dress. I moved to this sugar house area in 1996 where I rented an apartment for $375. And it, was then I, it is then when I truly realized the depth and charm of the quaintness of this town. The sweet little library, the sculpture beats that sprinkled about, the monument in the center of town, the prison that was on the grounds of Sugar House Parch, the history is so rich. Let's celebrate that. I've grown more and more in love with this place, and as time has moved forward, I have also embraced the changes that are inevitable. I understand progress, and it is a part of moving forward, but I also hope that you understand how that charm is so ingrained and has become a part of us. I walk and bike to Sugar House Park. I walk along the stream in the park, and in doing these activities, it supports me and my well-being. It's peaceful, serene, and calm. To build a gas station in this type of progress, we don't need, we don't necessarily need in that area. I don't feel like it supports me as an individual. It dilutes the beauty of this quaint and charming area, especially located so closely next to the park where families and children and all activities take, take place and not to mention the water that we drink, and not to mention the water that we drink. That's very important to me. And the creatures. I certainly do hope you can see that it is not just a gas station, but to me, but it truly breaks my heart in taking away the peaceful and serene gem of Salt Lake City in Sugar House Park. It is not only dilutes the beauty and the charm in the area, but it has potential to reap havoc on our water supply. I am tied to the sugar house and I'm very passionate again. Please look out for me. Please look out for my neighbors, my friends, and the animals. I was just there on Easter sitting on thank, that. Thank you. That's your two minutes. Thank you. <laughs> but if you've been there, you know it's beautiful. Yeah. Okay, the last card that I have is Molly Jones. You'll have two minutes. Hello, my name is Molly Jones. Thank you for your time today. I'd like to discuss two things. The first is we are in a historical drought. Anything that we approve that puts us at danger of contaminating our water is flagrantly disregarding the current reality. We must deny this proposal. The second thing is that I'm astounded I haven't heard anyone talk about Highland High. We have drop-offs, we have pickups, we have special events, we have students who walk along the north side of the park and then who additionally catch the bus directly in front of the Sizzler. If I understand the route of the tanker trucks correctly, we are endangering the lives of our children, of our youth. We must deny this proposal. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to speak on this? Okay, seeing no one, are there any emails? Uh, not after 5 o'clock, it doesn't look like, but there's several that came in, I believe, today that should be in your Dropbox. That would have been in the yeah. Dropbox. Okay. All right, seeing no one else who wishes to speak on this at this time, I will close the public hearing and bring it 
back to the commission. Uh, Diana, where did Diana go? There you are. <laughs> can can you like yes. address things from that microphone? Yes. Uh, so, commissioners, do you have questions, concerns? Amy. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, this is a question maybe for the attorney or at least for staff. Is there a um, is there kind of like a disclosure requirement for when we get reports or do staff reports that who they have to be sent out to and when? Here. Yeah, get, get it on the record. <laughs> um, just that we um, put in our, everything in our staff report and that's um, delivered to everyone. It's posted at the same time for everyone in advance. The applicant and public and us and everyone. Yes. Same time. Um, thank you. I have I have another. It's not a question. I have a thing to say. But if somebody wants to ask questions, no, me. go okay. speak up. The thing I want to speak say up. is that um, the the fact that uh, when you look at the zoning, this this site has a CB zoning. Um, across the street isn't CB zoning. It's a different thing. Um, but kind of like over where the um, the um, CVS is, is is a similar zoning, the same zoning, CB. And that has a whole list of uses, some that are permitted, you can just do them, some that are conditional because you must show that that use at that site, those two things together are, are appropriate, that they, they don't conflict, that there aren't um, problems with the use. The reason why it's a conditional use is because it, you understand that there may be problems with this type of use on some properties, even, pro I mean, including conditional or community business properties. So I think the fact that it's a conditional use means that the city hasn't said, this is fine, this gas station can go right here in this spot. It says consider this spot and consider this use. There are lots of places where gas stations are permitted. Um, there are probably a lot of places where there are gas stations in um, community business uh, zoned areas. But I, I, I think that the particular ones of this lot in this use um, are problematic. And I, I agree with the findings of the um, staff report. And I, I also don't think, I think that if we met the, re, the requirement for when we're, we're supposed to share information about the, what we, the research that our professional um, planners have done on this site has been met, I don't, I don't know that I'm terribly in favor of tabling either. I do have a question, and this is for staff. What's the difference between this development and the gas station across the street, the Chevron gas station? Sorry, thank you. So that one came in, that was approved in 2006, and it was under the um, Community Development Review, yes, CHB. Did you get that? The central, uh, Sugarhouse central. Central Sugarhouse Business District. Thank you. So it did go under a different design review, um, design standards when it came to the Planning Commission at that time. But it was in 2006, so the regulations were different. This is a CB. They have some design standards which they meet in regard to the actual building. Um, and so, and because this abuts the park, we've got the detrimental impacts. The other one is 550 feet from the park and doesn't have the same kind of environmental impacts that this one does. So they're very different. Got it. One other question. So if this had come in before the planning commission or before the city back in 2006, would it have passed under, and maybe you weren't here and you can't respond to that. So in that zone, gas stations are permitted uses. I believe they were back then too, so it wouldn't have come through the Planning Commission. Um, I just want to uh, clarify that the applicant, uh, the, the letter from the environmental consultant provided by the Sugar House Park Authority, um, they were provided with a, a copy of that, correct? They were provided with that on March 27th of this year. And 
And it's dated April 6, 2022. So they've had a right. long time to respond to that. Up that They did not receive it last year. So I want to kind of give you a reason for that. So the Sugar House Park Authority did submit their letter and that study during the time that comments were brought in during that 45-day review period. In the next eight months, come and go, the applicant, Galloway, we had gone through many revisions, many uh, meetings regarding changes made to the site. And so those were put on hold. Typically, we give any kind of information with our staff report at the very end, and typically it's three days before this meeting. Um, we held that information, and it was addressed to you. I had gone back to the Sugar House Park Authority a few times to ask them if they wanted to make revisions to it. They did not want to make revisions to it, and so it was submitted with the staff report to the applicant, which is very typical. And can I ask the applicant a question? Sure. Does the applicant feel like they've had an opportunity to reply to this environmental assessment? Absolutely not. Um, we got it for the first time a couple of weeks ago. It, in my experience, in my firm's experience, it's unprecedented for a planning department to have, and there, is a, there was a back and forth between the staff and the applicant, but this wasn't part of it for some reason. I don't know, it's inexplicable to me. It's unprecedented in my experience. And it's not just um, the hydrogeologist report. Right? It's also all the factors that um, staff representative mentioned today in terms of the ge geology, geological aspects, hydrology, flow rates, um, uh, constituency of the soils, compaction, all of those factors that she said that she listed a half a dozen of and said there's even more. You need to make an informed decision. What, what has been placed before you by staff is inherently speculative. Um, you can't make a decision based on that. You should have you should be fully informed by experts, and we can provide that for you. We just need a little bit of time. Does that answer your question, Andra? Anyone else? Yeah, just a follow-up question to that. Actually, um, if you had been provided all those hydrologist reports, um, studies, et cetera, that were supposedly missing at the beginning. Would you still be here with this same application with all the same um, uh, items that you are requesting at this time? Well, the application or would in it have terms changed of, in some way. It would have been changed because we would have supplied more information to to make you fully informed about about the situation, the the geological context, right? But I'm I'm sure, um, you know, based on everything we've seen. Um, you know, there's, there's just not, we're not in a floodplain. We're not close to a water course. It, it typically, um, and you've probably done this before, you have landscaping buffers to mitigate any impacts associated with noise. There's a humongous landscape buffer here. So I hope that answers your question. We would have tried to full, more fully inform you, but we wouldn't have changed the, the proposed use. You wouldn't have changed the application? We wouldn't have changed the proposed use, but we would have bolstered the application with more factual information. We would have modified the application. Okay. Yeah. Um, great. That was my question. Thank you. Anyone else? I, did I just hear you say you're not close to a water source? We're not close enough to affect a water source, right? There's a pond there, but there's no, um, in nothing but speculation to indicate that we're going to affect that. I mean, what the, the, report stall, the report also shows, which probably should be the subject of more inquiry, is that there is a, um, a PCE plume that prohibits this area from providing drinking water for the city. It prohibits it from being a, a recharge area. And, in, and the report says that in 1988, the Sugar House Park Municipal Well was, it was ceased to be used because of the, the finding of that, that plume, that groundwater PCE plume that prohibits it from being a drinking water source, right? So these are things that were sprung on us a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if you were aware of the plume there, but it's there and, and it probably warrants further study to see if there really is any drinking water problem. 
Anyone else? Yeah. Okay, Amy. <laughs> you know. Miss Shinderberry. I know. Um, I have comments for the commission okay. to consider. So as I was taking notes throughout, um, one a part of state code I also want to direct to our attention that is also in that same um, section two, A, C reads, if the reasonably anticipated detrimental effects of a proposed conditional use cannot be substantially mitigated by the proposal or the imposition of reasonable conditions to achieve compliance with applicable standards, the land use authority may deny the conditional use. Given that direction, I want to talk about the environmental um, effects because I do know this area very well and I know the history of this area very well. So, one of the points that the applicant brings up was that the statistic given that we have one in four less, which is leaking underground storage tanks, um, that the cause of those is unknown. I think that is the point of the staff's report. That is part of a detrimental impact to the neighboring properties that how do you mitigate unknown leaks, right? It's not, we can hold them to that standard because the impact um, to our water source in Parley's Creek is, is very real. I also want to say that according to public utilities comments in the staff report, this property is within a, located in a floodplain and would require the special permit that is found with FEMA. It's called a firm permit. Um, so I think we can also use their expert um, comments that we do have a floodplain situation for this particular property. Um, one thing that makes this area vastly different than across the street where Chevron went in. Yes, the zone is different, but this is going to go to the history. So when the state demolished the prison buildings and the admin building, they were kind enough to leave the foundations and the concrete floors. Those concrete floors and rebar were thrown into 13th East. That is a dam that is registered with the state and it is built upon rubble. And we know this because when Salt Lake County um, began construction of the draw, the tunnel under 13th East that connects Sugar House Park to Hidden Hollow, um, they had to stop and completely re-engineer the whole thing because that's all they found <coughs> were concrete blocks and rebar. When the Sago Lily was installed and approved for installation because it does abut the dam, it also had to be approved as a floodplain um, retention pond. It couldn't just, it's not just an art installation. It's multifaceted. That is the same thing they found in construction of the Sago Lily, where a lot of concrete blocks, a lot of trash, a lot of rebar. So this is vastly different than across the street in terms of what is holding up 13th East on this side, because the park authority back in 57 just didn't haul the rubble away. They threw it on. 13th East was not as high as it is. The park was not, you know, rolling hills. It was all flat. So all of this has been man-made constructed, but the proximity of this gas station, this proposed gas station, to the Sago Lily, which has more function than just its looks, is, is a really important impact that I think this makes this site also vastly different. Parley's Creek is an integral part to um, our water flow through this part of the city. It then connects, as um, Commissioner Tuttle and I were talking about earlier, it connects into um, Emigration Creek and Red Butte Creek as the three, free, cree, three creek confluence um, down by Jordan River. So it is an important waterway. Yeah, there's a pond. The pond's man-made. It wasn't there, naturally. The creek has always been there. Um, the pond was just a nice feature that they constructed back in the late 50s and early 60s. Um, but what the, the flow of that water is a very important part of our water system for the city, our water system for the state. Um, and I think those are considerations of why this specific site, and it is very unique to this specific site, that we should be considering and looking at 
um, the detrimental impacts and the ability or inability to mitigate them but based on the applicant. I will also um, <laughs> make, finally, my point about traffic. Um, I think that having lived in this area for a long time, you know, Sizzler being a destination was a destination for maybe 10 people at a time. It did not generate a lot of traffic. It did not generate a lot of in and out. That is part of the problem when this intersection fails to meet load at various times of the day. It's an F. The E is generous. It fails to meet load um, multiple times during the day. There's nothing we can do about it. The, the, the problem with the, the traffic, yes, the, the semis up 21st can be you know, somewhat of an issue, but I think the bigger traffic impact that I don't see this mitigating, I see this exacerbating, is how traffic going north is flowing through this area. We have to split off in four points immediately. And then um, now, but now I've got people going in, 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 and I can't move to turn right. This is a point where people are trying to just move fast to get through the area because it's failing to meet the load. Um, so I don't see that, I, I reject this notion that this um, particular project would help with traffic. In, in that particular intersection. Um, a destination point might actually be a little bit better because people would go there and stop. And they wouldn't then continue to flow in and out of this area that um, is, is really hard pressed to handle it. And if we read the comments also in the department reviews, um, one of the, the points that um, traffic made or streets made was that the city wants to look at, is planning to look at on 21st South, eliminating that third lane that exists up until you turn into the park on 15th East, or well, it goes up to 17th East, um, that that would then become a bike lane. And so now we've got an even um, bigger conflict with out, 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 going out on 21st South. So I think we have a lot of competing interests that the city has identified for that road, that section on 13th East, and also going up 21st South, that um, this particular type of constant in and out would be a problem. It is a problem at Chevron. So I think we can reasonably understand what the traffic flow will be for this um, opposite corner. Um, it is a, a big issue in trying to get onto 13th East um, f coming east on 21st South. So I don't know that, um, that for me the traffic part is really really focused on how that traffic flows on that intersection and how it already fails. And I don't know how we can get lower than an F, but I'm sure there's a way. If there's a way, we'll find out how to do it. Um, but that's a, that is a, a, a big issue on that particular um, intersection. And I think um, those are the gist of my comments that I wanted the commission to hear and perhaps think about. Um, just to follow up on Commissioner Barry's points, the motion, and this is a question for staff, specifically, you had several findings that it did not, you know, they were not able to mitigate, one of which was traffic, one of which was general consistency with the master plan. But in the motion that you recommended we propose, it is specifically the detrimental impacts to the environment near the site. And I'm just wondering if staff could clarify why they're recommending that motion as opposed to us, you know, identifying each of the, I think there was eight points that could not, could you just clarify that? Do you understand the question? My mic is not on. Um, that you want to expand my motion or my reasoning for denial? You seem to propose zoned in on kind of one of the adverse impacts that could not be mitigated. As I read it, there was like five or six. And so it just seems that, so. We, we can change that motion. We can. I'm add. just wondering, I'm trying to see if there was a reasoning specifically that I'm, that I'm just not understanding. That's why I'm asking. So I think overall, the majority of the um, 
The majority of the, the motion is, um, it, it goes back to the environmental impacts. That's, that was the key to the three, the four, excuse me, that could not meet the, um, that could not, I'm like losing it. <laughs> Okay, so the four approval requirements that they that there are, they could not meet three of those, and then the detrimental impact determinations, all of those were related to the environmental impacts of this project, which, which includes traffic, which includes traffic, yes, and so, plan Salt Lake, the the sort of overall exactly. master plan. So the master plan and any inner excuse me, um, environmental impacts to, from this site, created by this site, is what we are denying it based on, or asking recommendation to deny. Okay, I, I, just my thoughts for the rest of the commission, I would rather us be a little more specific, because my concern is ex post, um, there may be legal battles surrounded about the, the specific environmental impacts, and I think if we sort of delineate all of the factors, specifically environment is just sort of a vague word in, in my reading, but maybe that's just my thought for the rest of the commission. That's okay. Um, I would like to ask the commission if they want to consider the applicant's request for tabling this. It, <laughs> I, I'm not in favor of that. I mean, you can argue with me if you want to, but I, it concerns me a lot when they say, well, there's a year old environmental report that we didn't see that says that this site is exposes this huge park to a lot of environmental risks. And their answer to that is, well, if we had more time, we'd get different. We get something that said opposite of that. Not that we would change our mind. We would do above ground tanks or I don't even know if you can do that. Any of this stuff yeah, like that. It's kind can. of like <laughs> if that information is not moving to them and it just gives them more opportunity to get alternative environmental report that says the opposite thing then I, I don't I don't see the point I don't think that we've broken any rules I don't think that they there's any legal ground to put a table on it I'm actually in favor of tabling it I I think we give them a chance to respond I think we definitely want to remain consistent. There's been other items that have been brought before us where we said that as long as they could provide a reasonable way to prevent the negative outcome of a development, that was good enough. I know that we've approved uh, things in the past that were like, guys, this is going to be a problem for the neighborhood. And we said, hey, they can install security cameras or something. I'm not going to go into specifics, and that should address the problem. And I would like to hear what they come back with as can you address any of these concerns? Any, all of them, some of them. I think that would be cool to hear. The applicant did provide uh, quite a long, uh, today, quite a long um, response to all these things. And I think that um, while they might have the chance to rally, uh, as you say, some more consultants on this. Um, essentially, the, th the things which the report did reference, they have answered in the sense that they have already said, we're going to do this, 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 and this, and this is best practices, and this is another best practice, and this isn't going to happen, and, and so on and so forth. So um, materially, I don't think it's going to be uh, any different. It is a very long report that we got today, four hours before the b commission report. But again, that's um, that's within the protocols of the planning commission. So I'm not I'm not in favor of um, tabling. I guess I'm in in favor of tabling for a slightly different reason. I, I doubt that. You know, I would that there would be evidence presented that would really change my mind or that all of these conditions could be mitigated. But I feel like as a sort of matter of due process and fairness, and there's not like five other applicants waiting on this site desperately to like to develop it. It's been vacant for a long time, like two, three more months. I don't know how long the applicant needs to reply. 
it just uh, I don't see the downside of waiting, I guess. You know, and if we if we are that unsure of our opinion of this, if like one more report would change our opinion, then I feel like we should we shouldn't be that unsure making a decision. Right. If we're, you know, marshalling more information, it, it can't. I can't see this. If there was like some pressing like there's five other developments that are waiting on this then I would see the urgency. I just don't see the urgency here. And if the applicant would feel better and that they've been treated fairly by the commission by getting more time, I don't see the downside risk. This, when did, when was the application turned in? Yeah, so. Sorry, 20, last February, 2022. Ooh. Yeah, so it's been a long time. This is not the first time that they've heard. We think there are environmental problems here. These comments have been in the news for a year like we heard about come and go is people are worried about runoff and stuff like that so i mean if they had a great way to address it i feel like they should have the thing that they didn't get until two weeks ago which is 11 days more than usual maybe is the staff report and that letter that, that um, sugar house did so I, I don't see what other information is going to come i don't feel I, i'm not on the wall enough to say yes or no to this to say if they come up with um if they can find environmental scientists that says this will be fine, then that would change my mind. I'm not on the fence enough about that because we already have a lot of information that it's dangerous. And it's specifically dangerous to this lot and this use. Like if they were asking for conditional use for something else, a crematorium or something, we might say not appropriate for the neighborhood, but it's not this dangerous at this site. There are other conditional uses that could work in this site, but this, this one particularly is bad for this corner. Would uh, Commissioners Ghent or De Oliveira like to make a motion to table? Uh, I motion to table. Uh, table the decision on this application to give the applicant additional time to respond to the staff report and materials that they do not feel they've had a chance to respond to. I'll second. Okay. I have a motion from Commissioner Ghent and a second from Commissioner De Oliveira. Can I, Chair, can I offer a sec? Okay, go. Whoever was going to speak, I, go ahead. I was going to offer a replacement motion. Can I do that? Well, that's a substitute, substitute motion. motion. Substitute motion. Yeah. Okay. Commissioner Burroughs. Are you ready? <laughs> Go for it. Based on the findings listed in the staff report, the information presented and input received during the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission deny the conditional use request because the potential for detrimental impacts near the site cannot be substantially mitigated. And I would like to list those, which will take just a second. The, uh, Do you want to just make a reference to the staff report? Yeah, like consideration one, consideration two, consideration three, consideration four, consideration five, consideration six. I know what order they're in. And consider consideration seven and consideration eight that are found in the staff report correct okay does everybody understand the motion do i have a second i'll second that okay a second from commissioner barry we'll vote on the substitute motion first uh commissioner ghent yes commissioner lee yes commissioner tuttle Yes. Commissioner Shear. Yes. Commissioner Paredes. I'll vote yes. Commissioner De Oliveira. No. Commissioner Christensen. Yes. Commissioner Burroughs. Yes. Commissioner Barry. Yes. And the chair will also vote yes. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine yeses. So the substitute motion passes. Thank you. <clears throat> so I don't think there's any other business for the commission tonight. I will adjourn this meeting. Thank you. <laughs>